Welcome to Leaders and Learners. My name is Tanya McKenzie, and you can find me at the intersection of public relations and leadership. Join us as we talk to organizational leaders, elected officials, experts, authors, artists, and personalities sharing their stories, talking about how they got to where they are and how they continue to learn and lead the way. So without further ado, let's get into it. What's up, everyone? Welcome to another edition of Leaders and Learners, where we all know the best leaders are lifetime learners. And today we have someone that's going to teach us a little something about what he's been doing in Atlanta and The Price of Perfect. Yes, that is the name of his book. Um, I heard it's very controversial. So we will have the opportunity to chat with him, Mr. William Anderson, about his book. He's actually a three-time author if um, I got that correct. And he's been doing some incredible work. His career started back at Vogue magazine and he has been writing and starting agencies uh, throughout his career. So without further ado, I'm gonna let him tell you a little bit about himself. Mr. William Dub Anderson, how are you? Doing very well. It's a nice day in Atlanta. It always is actually, it's a great town. I love that. I love that. So let the people know a little bit about you, kind of where you're from and how you got to this point. I'm from Athens, of course, nearby University of Georgia and uh, started out, as you said, uh, as a writer for Vogue magazine when I graduated from Georgia, uh, left Vogue and uh, went to work for several ad agencies, became creative director. A uh, writer started three different ad agencies and sold them over the years. So I've always been in that world of trying to come up with ideas, trying to rethink things, trying to put a fresh approach to an observation, in that case, companies, uh, trying to be analytical, trying to be fair. Uh, so when recently, I, I've actually done three novels and one biography uh, over the years, in addition to working. Uh, I'm basically writing now, but this is uh, we're in a challenging time, and as a writer, I wanted to explore out of a love of country and out of a fear for the way this country seems to be trending right now, which is a creation of Towers of Babel where everybody's yelling at each other, nobody's listening to the other person. We reinforce our thoughts media that, that are playing uh, to those people who agree with them. We just, we're hardening our positions as somebody who has majored in communications and been in communications. I see that as a major issue. We're just not communicating, defying all the rules of how you successfully talk to somebody that you don't agree with and they don't agree with you. So this whole issue of how do we talk to each other, and particularly with everybody talking about woke this, woke that, uh, uh, racism continuing? Uh, I tried to get into an issue that I thought was very complex, and I didn't know if I, if I could wrestle with it. I was told by a very prominent black friend of mine in Atlanta, this, is, this racism is something you don't want to touch said people are really angry about it, and how do you, as a white man, ever know the experience that black people have been through so you could write a successful novel that portrayed both black and white side in a balanced way? Uh, I have been worked in many, a number of charities in Atlanta, started several. Uh, one is for inner city high school students, which I and a friend started 16 years ago. Uh, and that's for that's for basically minority kids who've come from almost no money, uh, uh, homes, questionable home situations, and rose above it. So we've been trying to work to build a, a leadership group, or not build, but support. These people are building it themselves. But support a leadership group, very exciting, uh, basically young minority kids. We've been doing that for a while. I also worked on the Atlanta Children's Homeless Shelter where I was chairman of the board and we developed the first homeless curriculum, I think, in the country, which is still being used. I worked with 100 black men here in their first big fundraiser years ago. So especially about a minority focus I've had, 
which I think I got from my childhood. My dad had a construction company, and uh, I thought I could get all muscled up. The girls would appreciate it. So I went out and dug ditches with a group of black men, and I'll always remember these were these became really almost heroic figures for me. I, they They had a great grace about them. Uh, even though they were called bad names by a lot of the construction guys, they ignored it. Uh, but one day I was, we were digging ditches. I don't know if you want to get into digging ditches on your show. But I was with some friends of mine, and we were overly aggressive, pounding away at the dirt, thought we were going to outdig the black guys at the other end of the ditch. Before long, we all had blood on our hands. We'd worn all the skin off. I walked down to look at the black guy's ditch. It was the most perfect ditch I'd ever seen. All the sides were level. The bottom was level. And I asked one of them, I said, why, did, why, why are you doing that? We're just going to put piping and cover it up. And he said, with great pride, that's my job. And that had a tremendous impact on me. He came down and looked at my ditch. Which was nice. and he said, I'll tell you, boy, you can never make a ditch digger. <laughs> That had a profound, that stupid little event had a profound impact on me. And regardless of the work you're doing, the job it is, how good or how big or bad, take pride in it. They took pride in what they were doing. They were wonderful people. That was a good role model for me from my, when I was 17 years old. I never forgot it. So that's that kind of directed me into a lot of the work I've done. But also, uh, my concern about America is why I wrote The Price is Perfect, which is basically, we it's, it's almost the other side of diversity, where everybody, diversity is one of the foundations of our nation. The other side of that coin is that everybody's opinion is true. So we're living in a world of truths. You're true, my true, everybody's true. It's making it far more difficult to communicate, when, especially when people harden in those opinions and they don't want to move to the other side. So we just start yelling at each other, get mad at each other. Uh, and this is not true everywhere. There are a lot of wonderful groups starting up, the mixed races who are uh, having suppers together and talking about things. I think there's a lot, a lot more we don't even hear about which brought me part into part of this book I wrote, trying to get a, I got two primary figures. One is a black uh, television reporter who believes that uh, discrimination exists. It's everywhere today. She's very strident in her opinions. And she is pitted against a white Atlanta developer who wants to build this incredible building on a piece of land in Atlanta where a black man was hanged in 1940. And the characters in the book are forced to take sides around this tree, which still exists. That becomes a metaphor for America. Now we're asked to take sides, this side, that side. It's like there's no gray in between. And so what price are we paying for trying to be perfect in all of our opinions? We're paying the price of anger and of a country split up, mad at each other, not communicating, not wanting to understand the other side. The key to this Communications thing is you've got to know the other people's side of the coin. And I really, over two, a two-year period in working on this novel, really spent time talking, interviewing, listening to black people I knew and didn't know, to white people on both sides, reading some pretty good books uh, on the issue, journals and newspaper articles, just trying to fill myself with where both sides of this issue are coming from and trying to gain a greater understanding of the black experience, which I thought I knew because I'd done a lot of work in the black community. I didn't know the half of it. I didn't have a full appreciation for the hell that white, the white race has put black people through. And it's unbelievable. It only really kind of slowed down around 1960 something. I mean, I grew up in Athens, Georgia, where there were coloreds only. Couldn't sit on the bus and all that nonsense. Ku Klux Klan was still marching in Athens. Uh, so I grew up in a, in, a, in a world that was not tolerant. Tolerance has been forced on whites. 
it's so funny to hear people say, oh, I can't believe it. I turn on the television and all these black people in commercials. <laughs> that is that is hilarious. Or the other side of the coin, I tell you, there's a thing we evolved into that makes race so difficult, and that is we categorize. First of all, blacks are not a race, and whites are not another race. We're all homo sapiens. It's, that whole word race was created so you could put blacks or Asians or any anybody different from you in another category and say they were another race. Well, if they're another race, they must be inferior to our race. I also think uh, an issue, a uh, challenge for the white race, is we put a heck of a lot of emphasis on achievement uh, and on success. And so if you look at people who are poorer and the number of black people who are poorer than whites is immense. You think, well, they got another race. Must have something wrong with them. They've not achieved like we've achieved. Well, hell no, they haven't because they started two miles back because of all the racism. Uh, I didn't realize the extreme difficulty of Jim Crow after the Civil War. That was a truly frightening time, in some ways worse than slavery. Uh, because of how you could be arrested and hanged. Uh, I got so into the black experience and so appreciative of it, I'll say. My wife wanted us to go down to Montgomery, Alabama to see the Hanging Museum. I said, I can't do it. I can't, I, I, I can't tolerate that. I can't go look at that. I'd already seen the pictures. 4,000 people hanged. Good Lord. Uh, it's been a tough tough sledding. Uh, William, if you don't mind me asking, what was your upbringing like? And I'm at, I'm asking because I have a, um, I feel like people are taught racism, right? Whether it's in society somewhere or from their families, but you are open to understanding so much about uh, racial issues. What was your upbringing like in your household? Was it tolerant? Were you raised to despise and separate from people of color? Like, talk to me about that. And then what has shaped you into someone that uh, has been coming very clear about the issues, the race issues in our country? So what did that? what does that look like? Ooh, I was raised in a very tolerant household. As I said earlier, uh, a lot of daddies, construction workers were black men. Uh, who I worked with, got to know. Uh, and Daddy's little shop was the center of our world, so I was at Daddy's shop a lot. And I got to appreciate these men uh, from a labor standpoint, appreciate all they were doing, the pride they took in their work. Uh, we had a housekeeper uh, five days a week. Uh, and that day... Uh, different income levels live very close together. And she was uh, somebody we just thought the world of. Just a wonderful woman who worked for us for probably 25 years. And uh, so I was I was raised in a tolerant household. Uh, never, ever heard bad remarks made about black people of any kind. Of course, in, when I was in Athens at that time, Blacks were fairly well suppressed. I mean, there wasn't a lot of marching around or anything like that. Uh, so it wasn't the exposure to a negative side of blacks that you see in the media today. It's it's amazing. Uh, I was going to say earlier about categorization. We we didn't put them in any kind of category. Uh, what, we were so separated that I never hardly saw teenage black kids. They just mm -hmm. lived on another side of town. That old famous saying, well, that's just the way it is. I mean, you'd ask questions. Well, why is it like that? Well, that's just the way it is. <laughs> mm -hmm. Which is kind of a no-brainer way to dismiss it. Talk to me about your earliest um, career move to Vogue. How did you wind up working for Vogue, and what did that look like? That was a totally unique experience. I called my mother one day. I'd just gotten out of college. I said, Mother, I'm going to New York to seek my fortune. 
She said, well, son, you can't do that. We're having meatloaf for lunch tomorrow. <laughs> oh, God. Mar it's like saying I was going to Mars for mother. But I had created some ads for some companies while I was in school. And I was real rebellious. And I, I said, I'm not going to get a, 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 a leather briefcase. I'll just put them in a Kroger grocery sack. That'll be my portfolio. So I go to New York, didn't know anybody hardly, and had to be reading the New York Times one day and said they were looking for a writer. So I went over and got an interview with my paper bag, put it up on the HR person's desk, showed my ads. And after she quit smiling, she said, well, we'll be in touch. I left and said, well, that's the end of that. They called me the next day and said, we'd like to hire you. Mm. I found out later the reason they hired me was because no Southerner, as dumb as they were to them, could be that stupid to bring a Kroger sack as their portfolio. So they thought this guy must be a leading edge, cutting edge, out there kind of visionary who doesn't give a damn about anything. That's the kind of people we like to hire. So the Kroger sack got me the job. Oh, my goodness. Look at you. Tell me about, um, what is it, The Wild Man from Sugar Creek? That was a uh, the first uh, biography I wrote, which really was became my, that was years and years ago. I still get royalty checks from that book. Uh, it was used as a as a supplemental textbook for colleges all over the country, and still floating around here and there. Uh, it was about a segreg arch segregationist Eugene Talmadge in the nineteen twenties and thirties. And that was that was a real study in racism and how it can be used to further a white politician's career. He supported the Klan. He almost closed down the university because the first black student was about to come in. Uh, that was quite an experience. Uh, did a lot of research into the South and the agrarian. It was a, it was like in some ways today they were trying to restraining in a cultural change, conceivably, in America. That was a cultural change in the 1920s and 30s when the Southerners moved off the farm and into the city. And it caused a lot of tension. Talmadge played to the rednecks. Uh, so I got that whole redneck side of the Southern story through working on this book. Uh, it gave me a real appreciation for what not just blacks were going through, but poor white Southerners also. There was a lot of kinship between the two groups. Uh, so that that was my first book. I want to know kind of what, what do you like doing? You, you know, you, you started these agencies, advertising, marketing agencies, but you're such a great writer you do this nonprofit work and you help underserved. What do you enjoy doing most? You know what makes me the happiest? Tell when me. I'm, when I'm writing, to come up with a word I've never seen used that way before or a descriptive phrase, that is pure joy. I love words. When I was 10 years old, my parents gave me a dictionary. I don't know why they would do it. Neither one of them went, went to college. Uh, and I started just looking at words, looking at words, and I just became enthralled with words in this dictionary and wound up over a couple of years reading the dictionary, if you read a dictionary. And ever since then, I've just loved the way you can describe things and try to come up with an original new way. I tried to do that in the advertising business I was in to come up with a whole new approach, a whole new fresh look. As Hemingway said, writers are supposed to make the truth truer. And that's mm. the thing that you try to do. You try to even analyze a subject even more than other people have and come up with an original thought. Uh, okay, engage with me in this conversation here. You know, many of us in public relations and writing, journalism, um, we are in a time where now computers are doing the writing for us. So I'm not sure if you've heard of chat, chat GPT or any other AI uh, tools out there, but 
Many of us that do write, we collect information, we process, we get creative, we think outside of the box. Here we are, it seems, competing with artificial intelligence. Talk to me about how you have seen journalism um, and writing and this industry change over the years. And if you think it was a good or bad thing, like what you've seen happen, good, bad, or otherwise, talk to me about that. Well, I think, uh, I think, I think what's happened to journalism in general, just separate from the AI part, it's just awful. It's terrible that we have all, all the media. I, I can think of very few. I know NPR tries to be uh, balanced, but uh, the media is just going one side or the other. They're buying eyeballs. They're buying seats uh, by playing to specific tribal groups, mentally tribal groups. Uh, and you say, well, where's the balance? Who's Everybody's starving for balance, they think, but nobody's getting it because it's just human nature that we feed on. If somebody's reinforcing ideas, we jump on that. We don't seek out, we don't automatically seek out contrary opinions. We get mad at them or annoyed at them. So in one respect, you can say the media is just trying to, they've got a business model. There's an X number of groups that will watch conservative or liberal um, and we'll play to that because we're running a business and they walk away from the chasing the truth. Uh, they don't suffer through the work you've got to do to really get both sides of an issue. It's just terrible. This, and it's not going to make it any better at all with this new AI, which will only reinforce what somebody and say it in a far more eloquent, probably way the individual could. I think it's incredibly destructive. I think that technology has gotten has outraced the the mind to control it. Uh, I think it's very dangerous in many respects. I, I'm not for that at all. And somebody, as you just said, likes to come up with original thoughts and finds joy in their own words. How am I going to find joy in reading something? It may be great, but a computer wrote it, for goodness sake. So I think it's very potentially destructive. I'm, I'm a little bit afraid of it uh, as I'm concerned about the direction that America's media has gone in. Yeah, um, as I am. I'm glad you shared that with me. Thank you. When you are not writing something, when you are not being creative, when you are not putting a pen to paper or thoughts on keyboards, what are you doing? What do you enjoy doing with your time when you're not writing? I'm an oil painter also. So I, love, I love painting. And I'm a flower gardener, which I really love. And I'm waiting right now. This is this time of year if you're a gardener. It's like Christmas and you're waiting to see what gifts you're going to get for Christmas. I'm looking at my yard and seeing which gifts are going to break through the ground that survived from last year and will be this year's flower. Um, and I'm... I'm Fairly good oil painter with still lifes and landscapes. I like to do that. <clears throat> I say I like to play golf, but I'm a world's worst golfer. Uh, I love to lift weights. Uh, I am actually the chin-up champion at my gym. All these young people, it. these young guys walk up to me. I'm knocking down chin-ups like crazy. They'll say, sir. Well, as soon as they say, sir, I'll say, oh, my God, they already know I'm ancient. They say, do you mind telling me how old you are? And I say, I'm older than you are. Uh, I don't tell them how old I am. And all they're saying is, how could that face be doing that many chin-ups? So it's really not a compliment. It's saying, God, man, you look old. How are you doing 15 chin-ups? Anyway, I love to work out. I like to paint. I like to grow flowers. So, I I would love to see some of your painting. Like what how can we see some of the work that you've done? Where is it all stored at? In my living room and other rooms, which is not the room I'm in. Well, you're gonna have to send me some pictures, um, William. Now, do you sell any of these paintings or what I do you did do? in the past, but I I'm I just 
I put a lot of love and effort and feelings of inadequacy. I, I just, people say, oh, don't you love, isn't it relaxing painting? Writing is relaxing. Painting is not relaxing because I don't think I'm any good. It's terrible to want to achieve something that you're really not gifted to do. Uh, but it's the desire and what do you say? Um, walk away from, you don't ever want to walk away from chasing your truth, even if that is painting, right? Yeah. Yeah, I love it. When it's good, when it's right, when you've created something that's right, that is joy. Amen. I'll take it. So let the people know how they can get in touch with you, how they can follow your journey, because I have a feeling this isn't the last book that you've written that you're going to write and just stay in contact with you. How can the people get in, in touch with you, William? Well, they can do my email address, which is Dub, which is my nickname, Dub Anderson Brand. Where did you get that name from? I don't know. I got in high school and I can't get rid of it. It's the dumbest name you could have. And everybody says, oh, well, I don't know many people named that. Everybody else is named Bill or William. Why well, do I like Dub? So, hey, anyway, I'll take it. Dub Anderson Branding at gmail.com. Or they can call me on the phone, 404-825-4034. I'd love to talk to you. I'm just trying to find a balance here with this racial issue. And how can we uh, be better communicators to understand each other? Where, where are you coming? Why are you coming from that? Why am I coming from this? instead of yelling at each other. It's absurd. So I think people ought to gather around more groups, more small groups, get together in churches, mix it up more. Uh, proximity is important. If you don't ever see a group or a person, you don't get to know them. You can move away from Atlanta and not see friends for a year, and you don't even know them anymore, and you knew them forever. So get closer to people. Seek them out. Get aggressive. And really some really good reading uh, showing the black side to white people that I recommend you seek out. Be a learner. Don't just watch the world go by. Do something different. Get a Kroger sack. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Listen, you gave your number out. Be careful. I might give you a call so we can continue to talk about ways to bridge the divide. Good. I wish you would. I'd love to talk about it. I'll I'll have my paintings ready to show you at that time. Okay. What would you ask for? Thank you for thank you for stopping by today. We appreciate you sharing uh, more about yourself, your life, your journey, and definitely your book and your phone number. So <laughs> we will be in touch. Thank you so much. I enjoyed it. Good. Bye bye. Hey, thanks for showing up to the podcast where we all know that the best leaders are lifetime learners. When you get a sec, take a moment, leave a comment what you think about today's episode and share it with someone that you know could use the gems that were dropped today. Follow and subscribe. You don't want to miss who's coming up next. You never know who could show up here and what they could say. For your professional needs, marketing, PR, communications, and leadership, make sure you follow us on all social media platforms at Sand and Shores or hit us up at sandandshores.com. Again, thanks so much for showing up. We appreciate you and we'll see you soon.